Hello and welcome, I'm Eloisa. This is session four in the unit of making personal change or personal progress. And in this session, we're going to be looking at why God made the provision to be a per parent for humans on earth, and also how the world gets parenting so wrong. We'll be looking at various false beliefs in the family and parent dynamic, and also about how children respond and reflect their environment when they're young and how part of the provision God has made to be a parent is to learn about love. As a uh, quick review, these, this resource is based on the teachings of divine truth. It's taught by Jesus and Mary Magdalene, also known as AJ Miller and Mary Luck. More information can be found at www.divinetruth.com. So far, we have covered in session one about taking a snapshot and self-reflection and how self-reflection is the first step and a, something to, a skill to develop in order to actually assess your life in a real way and come to know yourself and can come to, come to know what, what you are creating in your life and how that is happening. So we looked at um, snapshot and self-reflection that led into looking at cause and effects because if you find a cause, then a lot of effects will disappear if you deal with a cause. We looked at how if you just deal with effects, there'll be more effects and it will cause your life to be even more unhappy than it already is. In that presentation, I spoke about how when you understand that every single thing that happens in your life has a soul-based cause, then you have the, for the first time ever, you have the power to change your life. And what a wonderful gift to know that is. So we looked at snapshot, self-reflection, cause and effect. We then looked at God's way as a loving solution and how that is the most rapid way to progress and make personal change because you can receive information from your creator or your true parent God and you can receive feelings directly from God. We talked about feedback systems and how you can receive that information. We also looked at how you can make a change by developing an aspiration and desire, by growing faith and humility, being humble, self-reflecting about what the problem areas are in your life, and then take, um, seeking God's truth on those matters in order that you can become a more loving parent. So this resource we also spoke about was about how to become a more loving personal individual as it's focused on family and parenting dynamics. We spoke about it's about becoming a more loving parent. So that's the point of the resource. The potential to become a more loving parent. And now we're up to session four. And I think it's important to talk about, well, what is a parent? And particularly the, from God's perspective, and also how the world sees parents and how the world is getting parenting so wrong. We are doing a lot of things that are actually damaging to children rather than encouraging the next um, generation to be independent, self-responsible beings in all areas of their life. We're creating a lot of problems as parents. And so we will look at some of the false beliefs that we have as parents and also some of the major issues that you can start looking at and reflecting about in your own family. So why did God make the provision to be a parent? I think it's a good question um, and it's one that I am still being educated on by God and also by my friends Jesus and Mary as they have a lot more insight into how to be a loving parent and I feel like I'm just learning that. I've been experimenting with this for about 12 years and as we've, I've been experimenting I'm coming to know in my heart that there are a lot of things that we as parents get wrong. And so the beauty of understanding uh, how God views a parent to be is that you can actually have an, uh, grow an aspiration to parent the way that God parents us. So this whole presentation is based on the fact that God is our real parent and that we are all children of God, which based on that premise means that it means that those people have tiny humans in their care are really just older brothers and sisters. I also see it as that a parent or someone who looks after children is a guardian of children when they're very small and also their first educator. And so there are some responsibilities specific to a carer or a parent of children in the fact of how you bring them up because you are the, you, you are the person who the tiny humans are absorbing from and all your beliefs and feelings and soul-based injuries and emotions are absorbed by a child and depending on their nature and personality and also the allowances in the family will depend on how they respond to those things. In the previous units, we've talked about how there is a soul, 
soul-based interaction and, and how the soul-based interactions are the real communication between us as, as humans. And often we have, um, we, I spoke about how if your thoughts, feelings, words and actions match up, then it makes it a lot easier for children and also for others to respond to you because there's not a discrepancy in what you're saying and what you're feeling. So for children, as soon as they um, are conceived, they are starting to absorb all of the feelings and all of the things that are going on in your life. So the more that you actually allow, are humble and allow your emotions to flow, the more your emotions flow through you and the less they actually affect a child. The more you store and hold on to your emotions, the more that a child will absorb those. And then once a child is very, like a little baby and is born, but even in utero, it will start, well, it's, it's reflecting and responding to the environment that it is coming into. So um, the behavior of a child, the things that happen to it, they're all the attractions and the soul-based causes in a parent, they also then create injuries in the next generation if the parent has not worked through those emotions that are in their soul. So a child absorbs all of our feelings and our emotions and our addictions and our beliefs and it just responds and to the environment. And that is something that is really good to know as a parent because then when things are happening with a child and their different behavioral issues and the different um, emotions that a child expresses and then how we feel towards that, if you can see that as an attraction for you to learn something about love, then you've got an opportunity to actually grow and change rather than making it all about the child and that the child's, it's a child's problem and that you know if there's certain behavioral issues or whatever that the child is playing up and you don't really understand why. Remember, we talked about a principle of looking at yourself first, and this is very important to remember when you are uh, thinking about what it means to be a parent. There's some lovely divine truth presentations and some interviews with Jesus about the provisions that God has made to be a parent. And in those, Jesus talks about how God has made a provision to be a parent in order that um, you can teach a, to be a child's first educator to open the child up to the possibility that there is a God and that that's their real parent, to teach a child about God and God's way. Again, if you don't know about those and you're uneducated, then there's not much you can really teach them. So your education may have to start with yourself and then simultaneously, if you've already got children, you can be teaching children about that as well. Remember that whatever is um, in your soul is your real feelings and your real beliefs. If you say things, but that's not how you feel, you're often being hypocritical, or you can also be being in denial of what you really feel. And this isn't good for children, because then you're saying one thing and you're actually feeling another, which can be very confusing for a child. God also has made the provision of a parent to love a child. There's an opportunity for us to actually love another human. And if we have any other intention other than a desire to love a child, if we have a desire to get things or have expectations and demands and want things from a child, we're already out of harmony with love. If our desire is to love the child and to help that child to grow to be a self-responsible being, meaning that they are spiritually, emotionally, um, sexually and physically completely self-responsible, and that can happen at a very, very early age, like five and six, you could have a completely, you could have a child that's completely looking after itself making its own, um, even running its own business, have its own house, uh, completely living on its own. Now, most parents would be shocked about that. And I remember when I first heard about it, I was. But having now done some experiments in our own family, we as parents are really dumbing kids down. We are, because of our own emotions and the what we want, want as parents, we are often causing children to be very dependent and also to feel very entitled because we do a lot of things for the child and to actually take away self-responsibility for our own um, addictive and unloving reasons, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Another provision I, think, I feel a parent has is to create an environment that is, that is passionate and supportive about humility and feeling emotion and a, a personal expression. And in a family, we have a beautiful opportunity to live with a group of people of, diff of varying ages, with the parents being different ages and children being different ages, and having a, the opportunity to be self-expressive, to be exploring passions and desires for everybody in the family, and to be exploring about 
what is love in a practical situation and I feel like this is one of the greatest gifts of being a parent on earth and that's that God has provided humans is to find out like where they are out of harmony with love and then have the actual opportunity to change it if this is done before having children it's going to be much better for a child but most of us end up having children for a lot of unloving reasons and it's often not until you have a child that you go, oh, not so good, I think I'd like to do things a little bit different. Or, you know, you sort of get a wake-up call, as I suppose some people refer to it. And so if that's happening and you've already got children, it's not too late. Just engage the principles and you can make loving soul-based change and that will have a positive effect on the family, um, particularly on yourself. And then depending on the age of it, the children in your care, it will be either their choice where they actually need to choose to make a change in their life or when they're very, very, very young, if you make soul-based change, a child will respond automatically to that. There are a lot of benefits to becoming a loving parent. And again, when I say parent, just a loving individual. Because a loving individual will also be a loving parent. Because whatever role you go into or whatever situation you find yourself in, if, you have, if you're a loving individual, you'll also love in that situation. As a parent, there's certain responsibilities um, and if we model our parenting on the way God parents, God is a loving authority and God has laws that are set up in order to help teach us about love. What I have discovered is that I didn't want to take authority in our home or to be a, a loving governor of our home and so I was very out of harmony with love. I wanted someone else to do that or just to, to magically happen or for some somehow for it to happen without me having to do anything. And this is not how it works. God's example is that God is a loving authority. God has a whole lot of laws so that if we choose that we don't want a relationship with God and we don't want to love God, that we can actually still be God's laws are still working on us in order to teach us lessons about love. If we choose to ignore them, uh, there's a lot of pain and suffering that, that accumulates in our life. If we choose to live in harmony with them, then there's a lot of happiness and pleasure and joy that results, as well as a lot of other positive emotions that come once you live in harmony with God's truth and God's, and God's laws. So I've spoken a little bit about the provision that God has made for humans on earth to be an earth parent and as I said based on the premise that God is our real parent we're really older siblings so it's sort of older humans looking after tiny humans until the tiny humans can actually live on their own. So now we will talk a bit about how God, they, based on those loving provisions that God has created to be a parent, how they contrast to the world's way and how the world gets things so wrong and when I'm saying wrong I mean wrong from God's perspective. We're going to just touch on the injured ways that uh, families operate, uh, including um, about uh, certain roles and the way that humans view those roles. We'll also look at um, beliefs, false beliefs in families, addictions, lack of equality, uh, false definitions of love, dependency, and a lack of morality. So we've spoken a little bit about the provision that God has made for a parent on earth. And now I'd like to contrast that with the world's way of viewing a parent. And I'd like to look a little bit at the false de definitions of love in family dynamics and that parents have towards children, as well as some of the addictions. And we'll only very briefly touch on these areas, but they are areas worth self-reflecting and exploring further in your own life. We'll also look at um, false beliefs in families. And when I say false beliefs, they're beliefs that we have as parents or in, about families, in families, about children, about all kinds of things. And I call them false because they're out of harmony with God's truth and with God's love. So that's something just to keep in mind. And we'll also talk a little bit about morality or the lack of it in families and how that affects family dynamics. So, first, um, so firstly, let's look at false definitions of love. Where there are many things that parents in, in the, on earth feel are loving that are completely not. So one is even just about the role of being a parent. There's a lot of beliefs on earth that in general, most parents feel that they own children, that they can do, they can treat children in any manner that they like, to the point where actually we're very abusive to, to young children. There are things that we do to children that we would never do to an adult. They're in fact unacceptable to do to adults. Let's take an example. 
when we hit a child or smack a child or use physical violence against a child or even emotional or um, spiritual or sexual violence against a child, we are completely out of harmony with God's way of doing that. And if we did that to an adult, it would be classed as assault or abuse and you would actually end up going to jail. So the way that we are allowed, even by law, to treat children is exceptionally um, immoral. And so we talked about morality being the what is right and loving from God's perspective and being immoral, what is um, unloving and wrong from God's perspective. So we're hypocritical in what we will actually accept for ourselves as adults in comparison to what we expect a child to put up with. We are causing a lot of pain in children, which we then actually teach them to shut down. And that is another false definition of love. We actually feel that emotion is a bad thing, that being humble and feeling whatever we feel and whether that is painful or pleasurable and letting emotion flow through us is a bad thing. This is also immoral and it is also something that we then engender in the children. And so we actually harm a child and then teach them that they're not allowed to feel about the harm that has happened to them. And so the next generation stores all of this hurt and pain and suffering just as we have, and then they grow up and then we are just stunted. We are stunted in our emotion, in our spiritual, our emotional, sexual and physical growth. And we actually are, are toning all of those things down and learning to suppress ourselves rather than be the full expression of ourselves in our, in our loving passions and desires. And because of that hurt and pain and storing it and not actually releasing it, we end up then acting on it in order that we um, cause more pain and suffering to others and ourselves as we grow older. Often because we are suppressing the emotion and not feeling it, we then actually, on top of that, create addictions in order to not feel the emotion. And so this is something that is very damaging in a family dynamic. Addictions uh, cause all of the pain and suffering on earth. I'm talking about all kinds of addictions, um, physical, emotional, sexual, spiritual, any addiction that you have is not good. So we can look at some of the physical ones, which are probably quite obvious to see the destruction that they happen. So drinking or drugs or um, overeating, uh, sometimes really over-exercising, um, control um, is uh, all physical addictions that have a lot of negative effects in a family dynamic. So, you know, if you overeat, then you're going to teach your children to either overeat or if you are very overweight yourself, then the children might actually go, I don't want to be like that. So then they undereat and they might get um, eating disorders and things like that. Again, any physical addiction has an emotional cause. And so those things are not about just um, eating. They'll be about the emotions that are being denied in a family and these physical addictions in order to avoid feeling those emotions. So via that example, you can see that as parents, one of the ways that we've got it terribly wrong in, in society is that we shut down a child's emotions. And we do this from the moment a child comes out of, um, <laughs> comes out of the vagina and into the, um, into, the, uh, into the air of the world, you know. We are soothing that child. We are trying to shut their emotions down. And all of that is selfish addictions in the parent because we do not want to feel our own emotions. And it really boils down to that. There are so many different injuries and different dynamics and different um, things that have happened. We've had a unique experience in our lives and there are nuances for each person that are individual to us. And this is where you can go back to self-reflection and also seeking the causes, the specific causes and effects in your own family as a principle. And first, remember, you look at yourself first, so you're finding them in you. And if both parents do that, then you can start to be humble and work through those issues emotionally to release them so they're no longer in your soul, which means they'll no longer have an effect on others in your environment. And as children are just so open to accepting everything, which is part of the beauty of a child, they're so adorable and so open and accepting and lovely. And as parents, we are often exploiting that in children. And rather than having a, a true desire to love a child, we are actually treating them often very abusively. And I don't use that word lightly. I mean that we are abusing them because we continue to do the same unloving treatment again and again and again and again. And that is abusive. As a parent, when you actually realize what you are doing in a family, 
And this is something that I, I came to feel in my own heart was like, wow, what I'm doing is very, very wrong. And when you start actually feeling that feeling, then you start to see all of the effects that your decisions and choices have had. In families, there's often a lack of equality between genders and a lack of equality between ages. So as a parent, you feel superior to a child because they're younger than you. Depending on the dynamics in the family, there could be superiority between genders where men feel superior to women and that the boy children are treated differently to the girl children. And this creates as gender dynamics and basically gender inequality. And we reinforce that. And this all happens due to not dealing with emotions within the parents that are then played out between the children. So if a mother does not deal with her feelings of what she feels being a woman, how she's been treated, how she feels in regards to men, how men have treated her in her life, which will go back to how her mum and dad treated her and what lessons they taught her, um, she will act out all of those emotions. So if she was brought up that she needed to serve men and the men were better than her and that men knew more than her and men were more intellectual than her and that she needed to sacrifice herself for children and that could be both genders there and also sacrifice herself for her husband, give up her, her desires and serve the family, then now she is through her modeling demonstrating a lack of equality in the family. She is demonstrating that sacrifice is what a woman does. She is demonstrating that she is less than a man. She is demonstrating that she's there to serve the men in the family. And this is a, a terrible thing to, t to teach any child. The truth is, is that God has made all of us equal. Doesn't mean we're the same, it just means that we're equal. We're of equal worth and we're of equal value. And if we are not teaching that in our families and we are not um, demonstrating that in our families, then there is a problem where we're out of harmony with morality and with love and with truth and with God's way. So it is worth examining what are the dynamics in the family and how you treat um, boys in comparison to how you treat girls. How do you treat yourself and how do you treat the children? Often parents will feel that they know more because they're older, that they have more authority, that a child has to do what they want. Or sometimes parents will let children just do whatever they want and then there's a creation of entitlement where a child believes that they are superior and they feel that they can do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want. And whenever the law hits up against them or someone says no, they will get very, very angry about that. And these are issues to look at. So there's um, other issues within families that are also out of harmony with love. One of those is even being the role of a parent. So often in, in our world, we are not looking as parenting as a role, something that you just do just like you might you know, learn how to drive a car or be a taxi driver and you might also be a teacher or you might also be an engineer or you might also be a garbage collector. They're just roles that you play in your life for a period of time. That is the same with parenting. But most parents actually see parenting as their identity, as something that is them, is for them and they cannot live without. It's like they place their whole life around that and the investment that they then, the emotional investment they then have in children is a huge burden on a child and also it's very out of harmony with love. If your identity is wrapped up in being a mum and a dad, you can see that you're going to create dependency in the child because if you don't have a child, you don't have your identity. So we're causing a lot of problems as parents and this is one of the uh, this is a way the world gets it really wrong, is we are just, we are not there to have, to be a parent. That is not the be all or end all. I've talked about how you are a soul and you have a soul mate and you have passions and desires that are your soul based passions and desires. They're things that God have put in for you in order for you to develop and express and to share with the world. Now, if your identity is as a parent, often we, I see parents giving up their lives in order to look after the children. We also give up relationships and we give up, um, we give up our own desires and our own passions. Now, sometimes this can be different depending on the dynamic is maybe um, one parent gives everything up and the other parent continues with their job or doing what they want to in the world. But often I am noticing that uh, the different genders have different 
uh, investments in children. So sometimes men might have a feeling that they just want to continue the family name. And this brings me to the issue that we have this completely false definition of family. And family, every single, like based on the premise that God is our true parent, that makes every single other human being in this world our brother and sister. So we're all family. But there's been a concept created where our family is superior to your family or our family is better than your family. If you hurt our family, we're going to hurt your family. So what are a lot of the wars about in the world? Like a lot of them are about clan-based violence. They're about one family having a fight with another family some thousands and thousands of years ago. No one remembers what the real fight was about. They just know they hate the other person. And over time, those families or those clans have got bigger and bigger. And so the wars have got bigger and bigger. At some point, we need to just stop. We need to stop and look at it and go, okay, like what really is a family and what's the purpose of it? We all, like there's these illusions about family. There is so much hurt and pain that is created by families. I, everyone who I've ever spoken to has some pain with their family. I've never met a person who is truly happy. And if they are, honestly, I would sincerely reflect on that and look at it sincerely because to this day, I have not met yet any family unless they've done a lot of personal development on themselves as a parent. And I've never actually seen two parents in a family do that ever. But if they did, hypothetically, you could have a really lovely family unit. But ironically, if it was based on love, it would feel equal. So it'd be equal to everyone else in the world. And that would be a challenge emotionally to all of us who feel um, either inferior or superior. And it would be wonderful, actually, um, and a wonderful thing to, to aspire to in a family. But currently in a family, what I notice is that there is not a emphasis on teaching children to be self-responsible in all areas of their life, even physically. There are very few children who, particularly in the Western world, who are actually taught to be completely independent. And this is causing a lot of problems at school now because kids are feeling dumbed down. They feel like they need someone to look after them. They feel like they need someone to do it. As parents, we are often over-encouraging children. We're creating a dependence on praise. We're de like, I, I can list so many problems with what the world is doing with parenting. And I say this from my own experience. And when I first before I became a parent, I had all of these ideals. I thought it was going to be such a good mum. I thought we were going to be such good parents. We we're going to be a fantastic family. I used to say, if you'd met me 15 years ago, I would have said that my family was such a fantastic family. And the truth is they're not. They're not. And I was not a fantastic parent. And it is only over time and by experimenting and practical application of God's truth in my life that I have, and also, uh, passionate aspiration to know how God parents, how God treats me, and then actually working through all of the issues, and I'm still working on those, working through any issue that is out of harmony in me with the way that God treats me and God parents me. And this is where the relationship with God is so important, because if you don't have a relationship with God, how do you know? Um, to begin with, I didn't believe that, and I didn't even believe really in God. I didn't really want to think about God. And so at the beginning, it was all new to me and I needed to just have an openness to the possibility. And as I was talking about what the provision to be a parent is, at, once we're adults and we're in the position that we can ha um, have that privilege of being a parent, it's like the education that uh, the provision that God has created in order that we can educate children is pretty much the same education that we then need to go through as adults. That is having an openness to the possibility that there is a God, um, having an openness to being educated about what God's way is, having an openness to actually investigating and exploring what is love. And I find often starting well with what is not love to be a, to be a good starting point because sometimes it's hard to know what something is if you've had little experience of it in your, in your own life. And in our families, there's very little experience of, of true, genuine love. There is, a, for example, there is a lot of um, education and demonstration of unloving things and addictions and demands and expectations and dependency 
and lack of um, equality and lack of self-responsibility and unloving authority in our family. So there's a lot of when we feel about it and it just takes some self-reflection, which remember I said was about feeling how you feel and letting yourself experience those feelings that you have about whatever topic you're um, reflecting on. And when you feel about those, you can feel when something wasn't loving. And you can also intellectually analyze a lot of the time. If someone is hitting you, that is not loving. If someone is screaming at you, that is not loving. If someone uses threats of violence towards you, that is not loving. If someone says, I'm doing this for your own good and then hurts you, that is not loving. Um, there are so many things that are unloving that we can identify. Often we don't want to identify them and we'd rather remain in denial or the illusion of a family. And I notice that a lot of kids build this. They build the illusion of a family because it is very painful. And sometimes if a child actually spoke up and was truthful in a family as a very young child, there is a, the possibility that they would even be killed if they actually um, uh, were in disagreement with the family's belief systems. And this is why I call them false belief systems because they're totally out of harmony with love. I know that in, for my own experience, it was not until I was 30 or um, that I actually started questioning my family. Before then, I had not wanted to question my family in any way. I wanted to believe in the illusion that I had created that my parents were good people, that what they'd done was the best they could do, that they were... Um, it's not that that's necessarily how I felt. And if you'd really questioned me, I might have said, oh, well, this happened, but you know, and then I would have made some kind of excuse. Once I started feeling about it emotionally and actually being honest and truthful, which remember I said is so important. If you're not honest and truthful with yourself, it's the bigger, one of the biggest services you can ever do to yourself. And the more truthful you get, the more you then begin to feel what was really going on and trust those feelings. Like a lot of those feelings, and when I say that, work through them. Just keep feeling them, keep feeling them to the done. And once you get to the end and you, particularly if you've got a relationship with God and you long to God via prayer to understand what was actually happening in your family and how does God feel about that and you can receive God's feelings, you will know what was loving and what was unloving in your family. And sometimes there's a combination of things, but if something's done and it doesn't have a feeling of love with it, it's not loving. And so you do need to examine your motivations and intentions. And I'm talking about a family because what I've said about, you know, a family, you need to examine in yourself. Am I a loving parent? Like, do I even desire to love? And this is a question that we need to resolve in ourselves as parents is, do I want to love? When I had children uh, after a couple of years and reflecting on why I even wanted children, it was about that I wanted to feel loved. And that's an unloving reason to have children. I had to face up to the fact that I hadn't had children to love them. I'd had children for selfish reasons. And some of those self selfish reasons were that I did not have the humility and I was too selfish to actually feel like, wow, well, I don't want to feel how unloved I feel. And if I just felt that one emotion, a lot of things would have been different. But I didn't. And so then because I was trying to avoid that, I had certain addictions and demands and expectations. And then I taught the children basically unloving things in order to have my addictions fulfilled. And then I taught them addictions, which caused them to not have a relationship with God or not even know that the possibility was there and to set up dynamics between them where they were dependent upon me um, and their dad and that they felt entitled to certain things. And these are disservices that we have done as parents and they now need to be remedied and corrected. And part of that process is through a repentance process which is, requires humility and feeling the reasons why we've done what we've done and why, why we didn't want to, and it, were, it also is um, repentance and forgiveness work together because a lot of the reasons why we did what we did was to avoid certain pains or sufferings or terrors or uh, feelings that we felt or believed falsely that we couldn't cope with. And to avoid those, we created addictions and then we took actions to do it. And that's happened over generation, over generation, over generation. And so this unit is focusing on becoming a loving parent. If you do it, you'll probably be the first person in your family who actually makes a different choice about being a parent and what that means. And you'll probably be the first person in your family who actually starts to make some decisions about exploring what it means from God's perspective to be a loving parent. And 
I guarantee if you do that work, you will come to see that the world's, war, the world's way severely flawed and the way that we view family, the way we feel about family is severely flawed and they have a lot of false beliefs and a lot of injured um, and injured ways we operate as families and also a lot of addictions and lack of morality in families. It, I found it very helpful to examine my own family and my own background and upbringing in order to see what I've inherited and sense that um, what I've absorbed. There is a tendency and just something to look out for is that once you sort of hear about, well, my parents have treated me badly and that is part of the cause of why I do the things that I do and once you investigate that, there is a tendency to get very angry at your parents and to blame them. I suggest to definitely look at what they have done truthfully and honestly and examine it and to place the blame with the perpetrator. But I also know that it is in you now and you're the only one who can get it out of you. And that is a personal process that you need to go through and in order to release the, the, the unhealed emotional injuries you have in with you, it's up to you to release those. If you do not release those, you will continue to act on them. You'll continue to create effects that are unloving to everyone in your environment, including children. You cannot try it. You cannot facade based change your behavior if you have not made an emotional change. It, the emotional change is the real change. It's the only way to change. So you can change your behaviors all you like, but the feelings will still be the same. If you have children, the children will respond to those feelings and you'll be going, well, well, what's going on? Like, What's their problem? Again, that's blaming, not taking responsibility to, for the creations that you've created or what is coming out of your soul. So you need to see the causes in yourself and that is for each person in a family. So yes, you need to examine where um, your history and where injuries have come from, but also be humble to the fact that you've now acted on those injuries probably a lot in your life and that you've also done harm. And what I find is the most pain comes from the things that I have done by not releasing the pain of my past. And there was a phase of my life where I was blaming people and I did want it to be someone else's problem and I wanted that to do that. But it was pretty short lived once I realized that even if every single person in the entire world changed and they became completely loving, I would still feel exactly the same way that I do inside. And that was a really, a big moment, if you like, in my progress to go, wow, it doesn't really matter what another person does. If I don't make changes in my own soul, then I'm always going to feel the way that I feel now. And that's something to come to terms with, is that no matter how badly you were treated, how abused you've been, no matter what has happened to you, um, or, or you could have the flip side, and it still is actually abusive, but you could have been taught that you're the best person on earth, that there's nothing wrong with you, and your mum or and or dad could also have taught you that you are superior to all other people, that you can do no wrong, you can do whatever you want, and everyone should do what you want because you are superior. This is a very damaging thing to teach children as parents, and we do it often. And this is a, a big, big problem in today's world, particularly the Western world but it's happening in all over the world. And any time that you, you create this lack of equality, which I mentioned, you are now being very unjust. You're very out of harmony with God's feelings, and this is a false definition of love. And in that case, an entitled person is also has a major tendency to blame everyone else in the world around them. Often when we've been abused and hurt, we, as a child, one of the only ways that we feel to cope is to somehow make it that it was about us. And so we have a tendency to blame ourselves. And this can, you know, in a way, I suppose, if you can stop blaming yourself and start looking at, no, someone did something to me and grieve the hurt that was done to you. And when I say hurt, hurt's often an angry emotion. So it's really grieving how unloved you feel by what was happening. Again, though, there's all these different layers that you're going to need to go through before you actually get to that grief. And sometimes that will bubble through and you'll get there. But often we have terrors over top of that where we feel very, very afraid of certain things and or terrified, let's use the actual word. And when we feel terrified of a thing, we're not what we don't like the world is not humble to the emotion of terror. People are very um, are very judgmental about feeling terror or any fear whatsoever. 
and this is something to mention is that um, we briefly touched on it is when children feel emotions, parents want to shut them down because it actually um, exposes the emotion in the parent and the parent doesn't want to be humble to feeling their own feelings. And so then they shut the child down. It's a very damaging thing to do to children and it's something that then causes a child to believe they can't cope with their own emotions. And generation after generation is doing this in different ways and so now we have a society that thinks that emotion is a terrible thing to do. And it's so sad because it's the only way you're going to actually change is by releasing certain emotional injuries. And the only way that you can heal from trauma and pain and suffering and abusive situations is to grieve them, like to really feel about what, what you, feel, you feel and release the pain that is in you about those things. And that's a personal journey. It's something that is, will be completely personal to you. Suggest you do it in the privacy of your own space not involve other people in that. Talking about emotion, it doesn't really help much um, unless it, you know, uh, it can help under certain circumstances. Um, but often what I notice is people want to talk about their trauma in a way to distance themselves from it and then they just stay in the same story all of the time and they don't actually work through the emotions in order that they can be free of those feelings. And that takes, it doesn't feel great. Like when you're feeling terrified, you feel terrified. It doesn't feel great. When you're feeling sad, you feel super sad. It's not like you feel fantastic and happy in the moment. You don't. But when you've gone through those experiences, there's so many benefits. You realize you can cope with emotion. You could realize that um, you survived. You realize that you can do it again. You also afterwards feel a lot of relief. There's less fear in your life, particularly if you've dealt with terror. And there's a lot of ongoing benefits. So this presentation was about how, how God has made the provision to be a parent for humans on earth, how this is an opportunity to learn about love for the parent. And as you learn the lessons of love that God has, either via God's laws and the best ways of via a personal relationship with God, if you learn those lessons, then you can actually educate the children in your care about them. I've spoken about um, how humility is such an important quality to develop in your family and to allow children to feel, experience and express their emotions and express their personality and nature and the importance that you as a parent express your personality and nature and your feelings and your passions and desires and that there's not a compromise in relationships and no sacrifice. Love never sacrifices and love never compromises. We'll talk a bit about that in the next session. We also talked about how how children absorb uh, from their environment for, in a soul-based way and that the soul conversation or what is the emotions and feelings in your soul are far more important than your words. The importance of your thoughts, your words, your feelings and your actions all matching up and how confusing it can be if those don't for children. The opportunity to love in as a parent and to love those who are in your care and also your partner, which we'll talk about in the next session. And the opportunity to learn about love and those other qualities that we've discussed in previous uh, presentations about humility, faith, love and truth. You can learn a lot about those having children. We talked about how God is a loving authority and that you are the authority and governor in your home with children when they're young and that you have a choice to be a loving authority and to create some laws and to actually reflect the way God parents us and in order that you can teach children what to do and the importance uh, that you can teach children about love and the way that the world works, meaning that it is ruled by love and that if they're in harmony with love, their life will be much happier and more enjoyable. And if they're in disharmony with love, it's going to be more painful. I spoke about how the world gets it so wrong and how we often, instead of seeing parent, being a parent as a role, we see it as our identity and that this then causes dependency in children because if we don't have children, then we don't have our identity anymore and that our actual identity is nothing to do with being a parent. Our identity is about what God has created our soul to be and our passions and desires and we, we can develop and reflect those or we can... I suppose, enhance and grow those, or we can suppress them as well. And that causes a lot of un, un pain and suffering as well. We spoke away um, briefly just about the injured ways that families operate with various false beliefs, meaning beliefs that are out of harmony with love. Uh, the lack, uh, We talked about false definitions of love, which is anything that's out of heart, which we, which is anything we believe to be loving, but which is actually out of harmony with God's love and truth and God's way. 
we spoke about morality and how that is the right or wrong from God's perspective. And, um, and morality is a really interesting thing. You can actually make a decision, no matter what your soul condition is, to do something moral. So you could say, okay, I am no longer going to meet the demands of anybody in the family. And that's a moral decision. And you can do that and you can act on that and you can uphold that. And you will learn a lot about love by doing that. So if you choose a moral issue and you actually choose to do a loving, make a loving stance on that issue, you will be educated very rapidly and you, as long as you're consistent and also as long as you continue to implement um, that in a loving, truthful manner. We talked a bit about the lack of equality in families and how damaging that is and how there's a lack of equality between both um, age groups like parents and children, and also between uh, genders and families, and that these are areas to resolve. So there's much to reflect upon and think about in, you know, one, what is the provision to be a parent, and two, how, you know, what is happening in your family specifically to you, and how uh, is what you're doing in harmony or out of harmony with, um, with God's way. And so in session five, we're going to be looking at um, interpersonal relationships and how these affect the dynamics in families and and how these also um, play out with between children and partner relationships. There's a lot that we can learn as parents and by having the opportunity to be a parent I feel is a very very rapid way to learn about love from God's perspective. I wish you all the best in your endeavor to become a loving parent if that is your aspiration and I will see you in the next presentation.